here. Thank you so much for joining us. It's nice to see some uh, familiar names. Um, for anyone that hasn't um, had a chance to participate or see one of these sessions before, we actually have Mondays at Murdoch as a regular event um, at Murdoch University. And it's really just uh, an occasion for us to reach out and um, engage with a number of different stakeholders in the community. So you'll see a real diversity of different events and speakers that come up in these types of um, weekly events. And this is all organized by our partnerships manager, Megan Marnie. And so sometimes you'll see uh, industry panel members. Um, sometimes you'll see uh, some of our own faculty. Um, we have also guest appearances by alumni. Um, and so it, it's really important for us to do this because it gives us an opportunity to not only engage in a different way. I mean, ultimately, we'd love to invite you to our new campus. But barring that, um, we've decided that um, at least online, we can engage and keep discussions and conversations going about the things that are um, important and um, interesting to, to all of us. So thanks again for everyone that's joined us today. Um, Meg, are you happy for me to, to, to carry on and um, those that will join us will just join us as they come in? Yes, I, I think uh, we should begin. Good, good. Okay, so as you can see from this slide, um, this is all about celebration. And um, I guess one of the reasons for this particular webinar is that we're so overloaded with uh, dystopian type news stories. Um, you know, bad news seems to get more popular um, and good news stories find it hard to get through. So we thought with this opportunity, we would try and highlight some of the brilliant things that are happening out there. And um, so I'm really, really lucky really to be joined by um, Vivian King. And um, Viv, if I could just give you a little bit of an overview and introduce you to people who may not be um, as familiar with you as I am, I mean, I basically look for any opportunity to work with Vivian. Um, she was a resident here in the UAE, but has since now moved to the beautiful island of Mauritius. Uh, and that's where she is now. And she has started a organization called Sustainable Mauritius. And Vivian also is one of our industry panel members. And that means that she helps us in the undergraduate business school with forming policy and looking at uh, curriculum to try and make it as close as what we can to uh, what industry is requiring of graduates. Um, industry panel members also participate in judging competitions that we run and we try and get and rope them into anything that they'll be up for. Um, it's just another opportunity really to engage with industry. So that's a little bit about Vivian. Um, Anybody else um, that is not familiar with me, I've got a long history with Murdoch University, Dubai. Uh, I started as a student and I took um, the MBA program back in 2012. Um, but after I graduated, they couldn't get rid of me. I um, decided that I would take an opportunity to also teach with them on a part-time basis. So mostly marketing is my background. Uh, and then I was given the wonderful opportunity to teach some of their sustainability uh, units, and in particular in the MBA program. And that's really where my love is. And then um, I was also able to oversee the undergraduate business school for two years. So just coordinating um, the many things that go on in our business school and, and the wonderful facilitators that we have there in our team. Um, and I've recently taken a little sidestep to just focus now purely on sustainability. And uh, it's really something that's dear to my heart in terms of accelerating a lot of the changes that I think we need to make leading up to the 2030 um, agenda and the sustainable development goals that we really definitely need to achieve. So um, enough about me, enough about Vivian, um, and she'll probably be able to give you a little bit more too um, when she comes on. But just as an overview of um, what we're gonna to do today, and it's really simple. Um, as I said, we're gonna share some good stories. Um, that's definitely one of our priorities. And this is really just to dampen the dystopian um, news narratives that we sometimes get. 
and also just to share some stories that um, we have in the UAE here and also in Mauritius, because I think sometimes we only look at our own backyard when we um, may be not aware of some fabulous things that are happening um, in very similar circumstances outside uh, mm -hmm. our own geographical boundaries. And then um, basically we, we hope some of these sort of ideas, some of these um, examples inspire you in some way, um, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're a student, uh, whether you're a business person um, or just even thinking of opening up your own business to have um, examples so that you don't feel like you're trying to overcome a challenge by yourself. There's always plenty of people out there who have, who have got the same problem or have done something similar to what you wanna do. So that's also the purpose of today. Um, lastly, Murdoch University is, is a signatory to the United Nations um, Responsible Management Education. And what that means is that we're a partner and that we've committed to promoting and encouraging action um, between business and society, community members and the environment. So um, that's really important to highlight too as, as far as our role as an academic institution goes. So I feel like I've already um, spoken too much. If there's any questions that you want to ask us, please, would you mind putting them in the Q&A that's down the bottom? There's an icon there that hopefully you can see. Put them in there and that's a really easy way for us to access them later. We'll try and make sure that we um, put aside time for that at the end. Um, so um, that aside, um, Viv, thank you so much for joining us and making, making time to, to join <laughs> us. Did you want to kick off and maybe even give us a sense of what it's like in Mauritius and what, yeah, things, sure. are um, what things are happening for you? Well, firstly, thank you for having me um, on your program today. It's always a great honor to debate things with you. Um, over the years, we've done many of those sessions. And um, being in a business industry panel member for Murdoch University has given me a lot of insight into um, the passion that Murdoch University has for sustainability. Um, and I think a lot of that I can also apply back in Mauritius. But um, carrying on from there, I think it's important for some of the people that are watching to hear a little bit about Mauritius. Not many people have been here. Um, it is a beautiful island that has considerable um, natural advantages. It's got crystal clear lagoons, it's got mountains, it's got waterfalls, it has um, reliable infrastructure. Um, and of course, reliable air services, one of them being um, the UAE Dubai based Emirates airline, which frequents the, <laughs> the island very often. And actually that is how I got to know and fell in love with Mauritius um, traveling between the two countries. Um, and I think it's also, as we are talking about SDGs, to look at the um, sustainable development um, ratings that Mauritius has got because they've actually done quite a lot of work and you've also got to understand a lot of these ratings are pre-COVID so the latest statistics are not available but um, what we've seen so far is really encouraging because number one which is no poverty um, they are on track or maintaining it's in the green zone so I think uh, a big applause for Mauritius working so hard um, on that particular one. And there are many areas where they are moderately improving, uh, whether it is zero hunger, good health and well-being, and quality education, which I can certainly testify to. My son is in school here and the education is excellent that he's receiving. Um, one area of concern is uh, number 14, which is life below water. Um, and you know, when some of these ratings go down, it's not necessarily that the country isn't doing enough. It often means you have outside forces that are infiltrating your waters and potentially over poaching your um, fish that also influence those ratings. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a certain uh, a global problem. I mean, do we really know how much plastic pollution is in our oceans? And the, the figures are, are astounding, but however you look at those figures, 
the, the simple answer is that there's way too much um, plastic in, in our oceans. And what, what doesn't seem to be um, notified or at least acknowledged fully is, yes, we can see perhaps um, many images like the one in front of you of, of plastic floating around. And what happens is that fish and marine life mistake that for food. Um, it gets into our uh, food chain and, um, you know, it's, it's more than just plastic bottles and plastic bags that are floating around. Um, it's, it's really astonishing when you start digging at, at how plastics break down and the microplastics then, that then get into just everywhere. And I don't think that there's anywhere in our food system now that's not influenced by this. It's really very difficult yeah. to eliminate. And so, you know, there's lots of big estimates out there. Um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation does some fantastic work in this area in mm -hmm. terms of not only educating about, of course, um, recycling, which is only one dimension we can look at, but really mm -hmm. just um, looking at how we can redesign things, um, services and products so that from, this, from the beginning, there is uh, a better look at how we are um, using resources to make things. Um, and that's, that's just one part of the puzzle, of course, how to solve these problems. But if we don't do something pretty soon, there is going to be more plastic in the, in the ocean than there are fish. And that's a staggering sort of um, visual to have. Um, but I know that there's organizations out there, not the least of which are in Mauritius, that are doing some things about this. So yeah. I was really interested in a company that you were going to highlight um, called Crystal Divers. Yeah. Um, I had a personal experience with Crystal Divers that I'll tell you about a little later, but just want to give you a background to them. They have been in operation for around 22 years worldwide um, and have now settled obviously on the island. We have close to 40 um, paddy training centers on the island and there are only five, five star um, instructor development um, companies of which they are one. And they have recently won the outstanding um, contribution to local dive community award which is outstanding and they are also a paddy green star center and what does that mean it basically means they um, dedicate their business to marine conservation and ecotourism um, and i created a video for them i don't know if we can show that one yeah let's see here Viv, is this part of your sort of bringing awareness to, um, oops, there we go, playing it again, basically <laughs> getting, getting awareness around um, companies and organizations that you find in Mauritius, these types of videos are sort of visual communication pieces to do that? Um, yes, I um, decided as a business, um, I wanted to give back. And one way I could give back to the community is by really finding little heroes um, on the island. And even in the UAE, I sometimes still tag people or create um, material for them. It's a free service that I do um, because I wanna create awareness. I wanna spread the message that there are people that are doing something really significant. Um, and very much um, Crystal Divers is, is, as far as I, I'm seeing the role, they're redefining it because um, they're working along the four pillars of change, which is um, Paddy's corporate social responsibility program. And what they are doing is they're raising the standards. Um, their safety standards, when you walk on board one of their boats is something I've not seen before. And it's not done in a very obtrusive way, but it's very thorough. And I have an airline background, as you know, um, so safety is something that always comes very natural to me. And to see a company that takes that seriously is very welcome. Um, they also create a lot of uh, programs that I'll speak about a bit um, further on as well. But um, Project Aware is something where they go into schools and they teach and educate 
the next generation. And that's part of the four pillars of change. Um, they eliminate um, and reduce um, any single use plastic and they replace it with eco-friendly reusable options. And I went on a cruise with them uh, a while ago and I had um, quite a few small children with them, me. Um, we were three, five and six were the age group. And for the first time I had a fully dedicated person to the children, which I've never seen before. And this particular um, lady um, started speaking to them about what happens with the rubbish in the ocean, what happens to the fish's tummy. Very simplistic, but extremely effective because my son still spoke about it much later. And I think that's the big goal, isn't it? Making sure the next generation is just as aware as you know the older ones of us that really do need to change. So. Um, and the other one was they had absolutely no plastic on board. You know, normally you get handed a water bottle. They had none of that. They had um, sterilized, reusable um, aluminium water flasks. And I just thought that was phenomenal. That's and that's right. why I wanted to talk a little bit more also about the environmental stewardship, um, because yeah. they have contributed in, in numerous ways. Um, they often go to the um, Project Away events where they are speakers or they're contributors or they find out what is it that you need from us as a dive center that we can um, protect our underwater environments. Um, they've worked with National Geographic Planet or Plastic Initiatives, uh, Greenpeace Africa. Um, and I'm not sure if a lot of you have seen on the news, we had a ecological disaster a while ago where um, a Japanese a uh, vessel ran aground called the MV uh, Wakashio, and it leaked oil onto um, our beautiful East Coast um, reefs. Um, and they collected data. Now, this data is pivotal in being able to understand what's happening to um, the marine life, how it's affecting the ecology, etc. And so they are active members in this and still continue to be, which is wonderful. And that leads on to um, the next one that they're really good at is their education programs. Now, um, on average, they um, offer more than 12 programs than their competitors. Um, and to put it into perspective, you have larger organizations on this island, um, such as Sun International Hotel Resort resorts which has um, a lot of five-star and four-star hotels on the island it's a very well-known brand a luxury brand on this island but what's fantastic about this one and I could spend probably the next hour speaking about them but I'm not I'm just going to go focus in on the marine side of it is they have a coral farming project with the University of Tel Aviv um, and the University of Western Australia as well as our very own uni um, University of Mauritius. And it's a scientific uh, project on beach erosion and the actual coral um, nursery um, is on the coral side close to the beach and then they have an actual floating one. And when I spoke to the Director of Sustainability of um, Sun International Hotel Resorts, what really, um, delighted me was they expected the coral to start growing within a two-year period um, and they were shocked probably because we've had quite a lockdown um, due to COVID the coral started growing in less than a year so that's really amazing news oh. um, but they work in collaboration um, with this uh, with the universities and the data comes from a lot of the divers. So um, I think a lot of people, when they are in business, they don't actually realize the bigger impact that they create. And certainly Crystal Divers has done that. Um, and I think they are redefining the role of the dive center and they're doing this through consistency and the quality of experience. And by really dedicating themselves to sustainability, oh, you know, with the lockdown, a lot of these dive centers couldn't actually um, perform the work that they normally would with tourists. And so they've 
turned around and done um, online training. Um, and a lot of it is around sustainability. And their school programs are phenomenal because they are targeting people that probably would never go um, scuba diving and are introducing them to what's under the water, what's surrounding this beautiful island. So yeah. that's really awesome. They sound like they're just doing so many um, multi-dimensional collaborations and partnerships that they're not really looking at their business as being just a service and a traditional mm -hmm. model of, of providing a tourism service. They're also, mm -hmm. um, you know, clearly investing in the environment that um, that affords them to produce this this income, the, the, the coral reefs and the health of the oceans. And in order mm -hmm. to do that, they obviously need to collaborate with the universities. It's useful for the universities then to gather data from, mm -hmm. from them, from their divers um, of what's going on. They're, they're seeing it firsthand. So I guess they would be able to relate back to, to whoever in, in terms of um, this is what we see and, and this is what's happening out there. So that's really valuable, valuable information. And Thank goodness there's a silver lining to the COVID in some way in terms of the coral regeneration because um, mm. sometimes we have to look hard for those, those things. But, um, you know, I think that's probably uh, a healthy pause for a lot of um, destinations that have this similar type of setup. Um, mm. But I, I've never been to Mauritius. I mean, it's always been a place that's been on my list. Um, it looks and, and it, it feels to me like it's just a, a huge big beach resort. So what's it, what's it like there in terms of tourism and, and what types of things can you do there? What, how valuable is tourism really to Mauritius? Um, how valuable is tourism? Um, my last understanding was that they contrib uh, tourism contributes around 24% to the GDP um, and it employs directly and indirectly around 50,000 people. Um, and the figures that I sourced were that it was worth around 3.6 billion US dollars. Um, so a very healthy um, I would say budget for um, an island that is, it's significant, but it's not that big. Um, so, and I think the tourism has contributed significantly to the growth of the island, the development of the island. And people often, when they come and visit, are surprised at the infrastructure that this island offers. Yeah. Um, but I also think you, you were talking about, you know, the regeneration of coral and one area that has been affected is the adverse reaction of tourist numbers and sometimes behaviors um, on our island and so the proposed national um, tourism development plan um, is now putting more of an emphasis on um, meaningful travel uh, mm -hmm. with its goal being sustainability for future generations which is super important super important i know um, that that's something that resonates with my background in tourism and travel as well because um you know there's so many intersections there but you you begin to realize when you haven't traveled for so long yeah. that perhaps some of your holidays and tourist activities haven't really been totally conscious you know trying to, to do as much in a short period of time and tick the box and so forth and yeah. now I think at least for us when we do yeah. have the chance to travel again I think um, I think I'll be more conscious of of really either getting to know a place or being mindful of where we're staying and what what sort of uh, principles they follow in terms of their practices and you know I mean mm. it's really hard to be completely 100% sustainable um, in the tourism industry it's it's very difficult to uphold this luxury quality um, brand image and still provide, um, you know, the, the proper straws or no straws or, um, you know, food and, and things that are sourced locally. It's really, it's really a difficult equation to balance. But I think mm. there's more people that are pushing for that in terms of the mm. consumer side. And I don't think that we have to, um, we have to compromise on luxury or quality 
when it comes to sustainability. Often I think people associate sustainability or, or, or echo or green something with a lesser mm -hmm. product. And I, and I don't think that that is true. I think there's many um, examples we could highlight that in fact, that's not true and that, that people are doing a really good job of not only maintaining their brand image and their brand equity, but also not doing this incredible consumerism damage to the environment and, and just having this incredible waste to deal with. Um, yeah. It's just, you know, overwhelming. I know that, you know, um, for us in terms of the UAE, we've got a sort of a lot of similarities, even though we probably have a, a bigger um, number of, of mm -hmm. tourist dollars that are generated nationally. But there are some similarities with Mauritius in terms of why people come here, the weather, of course. But what I would see is also quite um, synergistic is that it's not just the traditional hotels and restaurants and tourist attractions that we see as generating the dollars and where we, we miss the boat if, if we have um, lockdowns and things. It's all the other knock-on effects of subsidiary services like the taxi drivers, the people who take photos and um, the people even in our agricultural community who mm. are now increasingly selling to our restaurants and mm. because of um, government initiatives and support and, and strategy in this area, we're seeing more mm. and more um, you know, agricultural um, entities form here. And that agricultural component links um, intrinsically with um, the, the health of, of waterways and oceans, because of course we don't mm. want to be just keeping using um, an enormous amount of fertilizers that just get washed into our waterways and yeah. create all sorts of problems down the line. Um, mm -hmm. So we have this sort of mutual dependency, right? We, we want to mm. um, bolster our food security here um, mm -hmm. We're not unlike Mauritius in that, you know, we are quite dependent mm -hmm. on imports. Um, yeah. And so, you know, even though we, we want to um, still have a healthy tourism environment, it's really important to, to know of all the other services and business and the, um, the economic outcomes that come as a result of, mm -hmm. um, of tourism, which is, you know, exactly like Mauritius. Um, mm -hmm. We've got, I don't know how, how much you've kept up with this since you've been gone, but we've actually had like a really huge uptake in farming and in, in particular organic farming here. Yeah. And you think, gosh, we're a desert, you know, we're not like Mauritius that, that is lush and has a different climate, but we still have this dependency on, on outside um, food sources greatly. And so, you know, we've got the green hearts and we've got the bio farms and the lots of different players in, in the market now, but they're really making inroads because we've got projects now that are integrating with the urbanization components of this, you know, this nation that we have that's growing at mock speed. Um, We've got um, collaborations like, for instance, with the Emirates um, Palace in Abu Dhabi and, the, and Greenheart. So they've done a sort of, um, not a pop-up, but they've created an actual garden um, for herbs and, and vegetables that the hotel would need on their mm -hmm. grounds. And we've got huge yeah. examples of um, big hotel companies like Imar and Jumeirah um, sourcing mm -hmm. directly from the farmers here which, you know, cyclically is, is, a good, um, is a good thing, right? Whether you can argue it's heavily subsidized and we're in a desert and we, we're, you know, we've got a water problem. Um, there's all sorts of technology also that is coming online that's so exciting about how we can grow food and how we can um, really make use of the vital resources that we have like water. I was recently at Gulf Food. You know, Gulf Food is still one of these me mega events in our calendar here. And uh, even under COVID conditions, I was just overwhelmed with the um, extensive uh, participation and all kudos to the World Trade Center that did a very really good job at keeping everything um, very um, socially distanced and, and clean and um, safe and secure. But um, I just, was amazed and really impressed with the um, tech that is coming mm. online in terms of how we grow food and 
everything from um, agricultural, oh, sorry, from aquaculture to hydroponics yeah. to having mm -hmm. um, the the largest, you know, we always have the biggest, the largest, the tallest here, but um, <laughs> I love it. You know, we have yeah. Apparently, the, the, the largest vertical farm in the world up in Abu Dhabi that's owned by a company called Aero Farms, and it's in collaboration with the government and other stakeholders. So it's not a, a standalone thing, but this is an incredible technology that we don't even have to have soil, that um, nutrients are fed directly to plants that make them grow. And under LED lighting and, and solar, solar panels that you know, provide the electricity for these LED lights, and it's, a, it's an, just an amazing type of operation and infrastructure where we can now have fresh pesticide-free greens yeah. that will not only, when it comes to scale, be, be more affordable, because we always have this argument about, well, okay, organic is great, but it's expensive. But if we can do this to scale now, um, we can have these economies and we can buy them and, and the prices are coming down. Um, yeah. Again, you know, that has such so many knock-on effects with um, many of our sustainable development goals, right? If we have better access mm -hmm. to healthy food, then we've got um, people being able to afford um, better quality, nutrition, dense meals for families. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's, that's part of it too, because the whole access to food is really important to consider when we, we think about urbanization. Um, you know, we can't get away from globalization. We can't reverse and, and turn the clocks back. And if we keep going on the way we're going, we know that 60% of the world's population will be living in cities by 2030. And that may seem a little ways away, but 2030 is not that far away. We need to think about and do things now that will make cities less of these sort of concrete giant jungles and more livable community spaces. Um, and this is why I love um, things like urban farming. Um, you know, this is not a new concept, but it is here in terms of building community because as you would know, you know, Dubai especially is a very transient community, people coming here for work primarily, not necessarily putting down roots, pardon the pun, you know, but that's changing, you know, as people want this to be their home. And um, so creating community around this type of um, uh, agricultural um, topic, growing food and, and, and teaching kids where food comes from. <laughs> I know yeah, it's, it yeah, seems yeah. ridiculous, but no. it's, really, it's really important. And it has a lot of knock-on effects to all the other things that we're trying to achieve. So this is exciting from, from my perspective to see these types of initiatives in the UAE. Um, what is, if, if anything similar, is happening on your side in Mauritius? Is there anything that's going on there that's, that's in terms of agriculture that's really excited you? Um, yes, and you know, I've been in the UAE for 19 years and I absolutely loved it and I still consider it my second home. Um, and yes, everything's bigger, better, um, more technologically savvy and um, it's very inspirational. Um, and so when I was um, out at a function at a place called Le Bourdonnais, uh, which is more up in the north, um, I met this incredible team that is working on the farm to four concept that I'll talk a little bit about because I see I've got this slide ahead. So um, I started thinking, hang on a second, there must be some similarities. What are people doing? Because we've got the European Green Deal and obviously um, for those that don't know, it's um, Europe's response to um, environmental sustainability. And their mantra is not to leave anyone or any country behind. And I think it's absolutely phenomenal. And the more I dug into it, I realized that the UAE and Mauritius are both a part of it. And um, it, the European continent wants to be carbon neutral by 2050. It's quite an ambitious project um, and I really hope we all get there because the way they see it is that we can only 
go ahead with this if we forge international green alliances mm. and partnerships um, that protect and care for our natural environment. And I was really proud to see that um, Mauritius was part of building a better tomorrow. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about the um, farm to fork concept, because I, I know that for many people, that's a very strange um, concept that they've never really heard about, but it's really cool. Um, so basically, it's at the heart of the European Green Deal. And it looks at the way we consume food, how we produce it, and how we distribute it. And every country has its different needs. So the way the European Union has decided to work on this, in simple terms, is if you are a country that is financially quite stable, but you would like expertise that is, you know, available to help you uh, become more scientific and do more experiments, then they will assist you with the right teams. If you are a country that may need a lot more financial aid to start a lot of these projects, that's something you can apply for. And some countries may just want more training as well for um, their farmers. And one um, concept that uh, Mauritius is now following is, um, which I'll actually, I realize I'm going to talk a little bit more about exactly what Mauritius is doing with that. But the farm to form um, concept is shedding a light um, on what countries are actually doing with their food production. Um, they want more transparency and they certainly want to promote discussions, not only um, amongst farmers, but it needs to spread. That message is already spreading from some of the hotels that are yeah. advertising which farms they are using, very much like you were saying in the UAE, the Palace Hotel is very proud of um, utilizing food that was produced locally and mm. sustainably. Um, so, and also I think the most important aspect of this is waste and loss management because we have become globally a society that is just far too wasteful um, and we don't recycle. So a lot of the um, concepts that the European Green Deal is based upon is the circular economy. Right. So, okay. yeah. So I think one great thing is to maybe look at what are the similarities between the two countries yeah. Because this one yeah. excited me because being a, a proud UAE ex person uh, and now absolutely in love with my new home, um, I you do start looking at what the differences are and the similarities. And interestingly enough, both countries rely heavily, heavily on food imports. I mean, the UAE imports 85, up to 85% of its food. Um, and Mauritius has a self-sufficiency ratio of less than 30%. So they're pretty much sailing in the same boat when it comes to that. And therefore um, they have to build food resilience to yeah. um, uh, by engaging more local production. Um, and also I think, with what's going on at the moment, we've we've also understood that we need to develop diverse international partnerships, which Mauritius is very heavily into, and, and so is the UAE. And of course, climate is now highlighting the need for food security in both countries. So if you're looking at um, the climatic um, challenges that we face, they are quite diverse. I mean, Dubai is a very hot country for four months of the year, where um, agricultural farming has traditionally been an absolute challenge. Now with all the new innovation that they've come up with, it's, it looks like we can sustain that a lot better. Um, whereby Mauritius has quite, I would say the temperatures don't vary as extreme as um, Dubai and we have a lot more fertile land, mm -hmm. but our land mm -hmm. is a lot less. So production volume is obviously going to be a lot lower. Um, and you mentioned it earlier on, is water. Um, mm. Water has become a massive problem globally because we are not looking after it, we're abusing it, um, or we just don't have enough, like the UAE just doesn't have enough. And 
Um, the World Resources Institute has classified the UAE as having extremely high water stress. Um, what that basically means is that 80% of its available surface and underground water is being used every year. That's a lot. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. you know, and also with global warming, here in, in Mauritius, we are experiencing droughts, not extreme droughts, but we are experiencing bouts of droughts. And with that, we all of a sudden get these flash floods. These We used to have quite consistent rainfall. Now um, we often have these flash floods that can be very destructive to crops and livelihoods, um, as you well know. Um, so that is, those factors, I think, um, quite difficult. And also, it's obviously, the UAE, beautiful as it is, but most of it is desert. Um, so I was quite happy to read that um, up in uh, Abu Dhabi, they're actually uh, researching how to manufacture their own soil to grow uh, wheat and rice so that it is um, adaptable to the circumstances around it, which, you know, every problem has a solution. And hopefully, you know, with these um, diverse climatic challenges, um, both countries can, can rise to them. Yeah, I think um, certainly you've touched on the key issues there and it's extreme weather is, is, is one of the global risks that was even identified, I think, by the World Economic yeah. Forum in 2021. And when you think about, um, you know, global warming and, and then you think about snowstorms like that that hit Texas yeah. last month and it just doesn't reconcile with global warming, of course, but of course the earth is made up of lots of these different systems and processes. And so it just takes one or two to tip a certain way too much and everything mm -hmm. else falls out of balance. Um, yeah. We've had uh, no surprise, but four of, the, four of the warmest years in history recorded in the last four years. Um, and so, you know, you could say one year might be an anomaly, but four in a row is not. And so our trajectory is just not really going in the right direction. This makes it even worse, I guess, when we have things like COVID, um, which disrupt supply chains. And all of a sudden we realize um, there's not enough toilet paper on the, on the shelves. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, really a test of the resilience of supply chain, right? Because um, mm -hmm. if we're so dependent on outside sources for, for simple things, um, you know, we yeah. sometimes are a little bit critical of why can't we get, you know, grapes this week? Or why does why the grocery store have no good oranges? And, you know, we don't yeah. grow grapes and oranges here in the UAE. So <laughs> there's a reason for that. Um, you know, yeah. it's really that we're so strategically well located Dubai as a destination in some ways that we are so um, connected you know to the east and the west in many in many senses not only in terms of people travel but cargo travel so we've we've yeah. been spoiled with what we can access um, yeah. but I think and I hope that the consumer appetites are changing too to realize that you know um, the, the miles that are on some of our food is not great. Um, and this must be the same issue for Mauritius as well, but um, changing consumer patterns is one of the ways that we can um, bring some light to this area. And also, you know, just maybe try and promote uh, eating more of the foods that are produced locally that are, that are accessible. I mean, use cucumber to 25 different ways now, you know. <laughs> It's, it's something that um, perhaps is a little old school even in, it, in the thinking, but, um, you know, it, I think the COVID at least has, has given us a bit of a shock sometimes to what is um, or how, how dependent we are, you know, on these connections and our supply mm -hmm. chains. Um, and it's, it's really critical for us to make them far more resilient than what they are. And I'm sure a lot of organizations are thinking along the same way. Um, yeah, I, yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree with you because, um, ah, oh, you're gonna show my, or shall I just oh, talk a little bit maybe yeah, about COVID? About um, yeah, and then we can go into that one. Um, you know, the Suez crisis with the, the ship that was um, stranded for a couple of days, you know, when you look at the, 
the facts behind it that 10 to 15 percent, depending on the day, of the world's trade is completely at a standstill. Luckily, now it's moving, but for a couple of is days, the World now? Health oh, Express, yes, my, oh, it's slowly being tugged out, um, which it's actually moved. I don't know how much it's unblocked. Um, so I'll have to watch the news update after this. Yeah. But yes, I believe they they brought some help down. Um, we but take the problem it, is we this video, but um, Viv, in terms of um, what you're seeing in the yes. in Mauritius, it's a really nice, cute little video of yeah, sure, sure, awareness to things. I did that video um, after meeting the smart agricultural team um, and I was so utterly inspired by it because um, this program, which is part of the um, European Green Deal, is helping farmers in their agroecological transition. Um, and what that means is they're actually analysing each farm for its own different needs. You might have a very large farm that has a very different um, requirement to a smallholder and we have a lot of small holdings on this island a lot of organically driven um, small holdings so it's about um, educating them about uh, how they can uh, increase the capacity um, and also these droughts that I was speaking about earlier on you know every time there's a drought there's obviously the pest pests that come along and normally they wouldn't stay that long but because the drought maybe took a little longer than expected those pests are around and your natural instinct as a farmer is I need to save my crop um, and so you would use a lot more pesticide that then lands up in our food system and obviously has awful um, consequences for us all and so they concentrating on on using sustainable and resilient farming practices that really help these farmers understand that they have alternatives that are not expensive um, and also you know understanding that we are now so vulnerable to what COVID has done to us globally um, and the cost of imported food. Um, they have now really emphasized enhancing local production. Um, and one of the amazing projects that they are um, doing is through the um, University of Mauritius. Um, yet again, they are quite pivotal in a lot of projects here. Um, and they are looking at a climate resilient um, farming uh, community where they can train and teach and do scientific research. Um, the Mauritius Chamber of Commerce is also researching new techniques of farming. Um, a lot of it involves um, sheltered farming because obviously if we do have a cyclone, um, all of our um, food would be affected and how they can safeguard that. Um, and before I carry on too much, do we still have time? Yeah, no, we have, we have, no, please. Yeah. Um, I mean, it oh, sounds okay, like cool. there's just so many things happening there in terms of collaboration. Um, yeah. It begs the question whether there's uh, um, opportunity also for the UAE to, to share um, information and and collaborate on a number of different things, at least of all um, between academia, that's always a natural sort of partnership opportunity. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, everything that you've have mentioned there is synergistic with, I think a lot of things that are happening here. Um, mm. I guess that's really to the main purpose behind your organization to not only be advocate for these small holding farmers and and businesses that are doing these things above and beyond um, mm -hmm. because they may not have the marketing budget to to get out there and and you know let people know what they're doing and mm -hmm. it is really hard to keep up with all the information that is um, out there you know it's a full-time job to yeah. research what's going on and not everybody has a wingbang website to to go to and to find out information on so 
through these collaborations and partnerships, I think it's a great way to give visibility to these, these things that we may not otherwise know about. Um, so that's exactly what you're going to keep doing, right? Well, the wonderful thing is um, I stopped for a little while um, because we had, um, unfortunately, um, COVID in our family. Um, um, not me personally, but um, close family. And the amount of people that actually wrote to me on Instagram to say, please keep up the work and could you actually advertise these people um, was really heartwarming because sometimes you think you put something out there in the media and, and nobody really responds to you, but there is a relationship that you are building and you find that only when you stop sometimes. Um, but yes, it's these kind of projects that I certainly want to highlight and continue to highlighting. And, and so I always invite people, let me know. And I won't just put it out there. I like to do my research probably because of my background. Um, I will um, take a couple of hours before I actually put a video out and one of you just to make sure that I understand it well and that the facts are correct. Yeah, I think that's really, really important, especially um, as consumers of, of media. We want to know that there's trusted sources where we're getting our information from yeah. that, um, you know, have the right message and the right facts. Mm. And, mm. Um, you know, there's no one governing the internet. So we have to be smart about it ourselves in terms of where we get our yeah. information. And I think mm -hmm. the first step is certainly awareness. Um, everything we've talked about today and you've mentioned about Mauritius is going on to some degree here in the UAE. Um, we mm. may have more visibility and, and sort of eyeballs on certain things, right? But um, it's not a simple solution. It's doesn't, it doesn't require just one piece of the puzzle to be put in and, and everything will be fine. Mm. So we've got to think of it really holistically and we've got to think of it um, more than just a linear type of process. Um, yeah. And I think apart from the collaboration and partnership things, which I know we've stressed, it also requires us to consider perhaps there's stakeholders that aren't traditionally sitting at the table with us making decisions or part of these mm -hmm. conversations. And I think community um, members is an important aspect to, to consider. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's many wonderful advocacy groups here as well that are doing similar things to you. Mm -hmm. um, bring attention to small business owners, um, people who are trying to make a dent in the um, food scene here with good wholesome offerings and, um, you know, getting things from local farmers and supporting them. And so it's really nice to see um, that happening, but mm -hmm. we need more of it. And um, mm -hmm. we need, you know, to share these ideas regularly and make sure that people get their, their time in the sun. Um, <laughs> that's... that's yeah, another pun, goodness. I just thought of another one before. What do you call an expat? Do you call them like an ex-expat? Or like you're, you've gone to Mauritius now, so, you know, I'm not sure what the proper term would be. But um, I think I'm just, yeah, I'm just a global expat, I think, permanent. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. a cosmopolitan woman. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I guess all of this leads us to the thought about the role of business. And that's my area, of course, of, um, of teaching and research mm -hmm. and study and interest. But I've always um, said, and you would know this, that the role of business is not just to make money. It doesn't yeah. mean that we are charity. It does mean that we have to be economically feasible. But if mm -hmm. you're thinking about the purpose of business, um, business offers us arguably the, the largest and best resources to make change. We cannot rely on other entities alone like government or industry bodies or the community or anybody else in singular to, to make these changes. But business has the capacity to generate you know, resources, income and time and, and has people against it. So mm -hmm. purposeful business, I think, is something that not only consumers will demand, but that will be actually demanded also by investment, the investment community. And it really needs to be an integral part of the puzzle if we're going to achieve our sustainable development goals. More than that, it's good to be purposeful, but it's more important even uh, to be effective, to be um, more than just the light and fluffy and feel good stuff. It has to be effective. The changes that you make have to be effective. So even if they're small changes, they're small changes. It's good. It's going in the right direction and it, and it can create momentum yeah. by even just modeling that change. Others will well, see perfectly it. perfectly imperfect. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so 
you know, I think um, I thank you so much for for sharing some of those things. I know there's a whole box of other businesses and organisations you've got which you'd like to to also mention, but maybe we can bring you back another time and we can talk about some some other things that are going on in Mauritius. Um, Gosh, I'd love that, yeah. I don't know whether we've got any time for questions. I don't even, let's just check and see if we have any questions here. Um, we've got one here that I see, it's just pretty broad. Mm. So if someone is saying, um, what would you say the best thing that people can do to make a difference to the planet? Oh, that is a broad one. Uh, yeah, got 30 <laughs> um, seconds. What I okay in thirty seconds. What I would say is, do what you are good at. Um, you have people that maybe are good at marketing. You have good people that are good at organizing. Um, you have people that are good at making things. For example, you know, even if you've got a little stand and you are making soaps or um, coconut bowls, you are um, at the forefront of change. Um, mm -hmm. Just because I'm advertising or you are a scientific researcher who's got this bombshell moment, um, we are all in it together. Just because mm. you are smaller um, or somebody is bigger doesn't mean that um, one is better than the other. It's only through collaboration that we can actually make the change. Um, yeah. That's how I would see it. And that's why my mantra is always perfectly imperfect because I'm not perfect at all when it comes to eco. I'm still learning. I'm still yeah. adjusting. Um, yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, it would be It's very difficult. Um, but the intentions, I guess, mm. are there. That's important. And I would just echo that as well, that any small change is worthwhile. Um, become informed. I'm always pushing my students, especially to be yeah. informed and get good information and think um, where this information is coming from, check things out. And, you know, um, the biggest power I think that we have is, is as consumers and everybody is a consumer. Everybody has choices yeah. of where to spend their dollar to a large degree. Yeah. So use that with, with power and um, make some good choices in that way. Mm. Thanks, Vivian. I really, I really appreciate you being part of this. I know that um, you've got all the usual um, social media avenues that people can get in touch with you um, if they want to. Certainly your website has a good amount of information. And um, from, from our side, you know, um, these seminars are often put up on our YouTube channel so people can go back right. at them and, and check them out and um, get in touch. But mm. thank you again so much for your time. It was really fun. No, um, thank, thank you for having me. Always a delight. I know and, you and uh, I can carry on for hours. <laughs> yeah, I know. We could probably have our own conversation. Thank you, everyone else, for joining us as well. Um, I'm going to leave you with this nice final video that um, video, that Vivian has also created, and it basically summarizes a lot of the work that she's doing. And um, please, if you've got any questions um, for us afterwards, feel free to contact us. But thank you. <laughs>